The scripture reading for this morning, if you'd like to follow along, is from Jeremiah, the sixth chapter, beginning in verse 16, going through 20. That is Jeremiah, the sixth chapter, beginning in verse 16. This is what the Lord says. Stand at the crossroad and look. Ask for the ancient pathways. Ask where the good way is and walk in it, and you will find rest for your souls. But you say, we will not walk in it. I appointed a watchman over you and said, Listen to the sound of the trumpet. But you said, We will not listen. Therefore, hear, O nations, observe, O witness, and what will happen to them. Hear, O earth, I am bringing disaster on this people. The fruit of their schemes, because they have not listened to my words and have rejected my law. What do I care about the incense from Sheba or the sweet calamus, but from a distant land? Your burnt offerings are not acceptable. Your sacrifices do not please me. Good morning. Good to see you. Good to see those who are visiting with us. It's been a good morning so far. I'd like to give my happiness for Andrew and Michael placing membership with our family here. Uh, They are outstanding young men uh, who have a lot to offer and have a lot to offer our congregation. Uh, And as Mark said, I hope that you will take the time to not let them get out of here very quick today uh, and go up and introduce yourself to them if you haven't already uh, and and make them uh, feel welcome and a a part of our family. We certainly are going to put them to work immediately. Uh, We'll find definitely plug them in with some of the things that we have going on here. Uh, And if you are thinking about a congregation, looking for a church home, uh, we're kind of uh, attached to one another here. Uh, So we'll say, you found your home, uh, and we'd like you to attach with us as well so that we can continue to grow and continue to be a light in this community uh, and to share the gospel to those people that we come in contact with. Yesterday, I had the opportunity to travel back to Ironton, and it was a good visit. It was a long day uh, to lay to rest a very beautiful Christian lady. Uh, And I just thank you and thank the elders for allowing me the freedom to go back to that congregation when needed to be able to do funerals uh, of of people that I have grown to love over the 18 years that I was there. Uh, She will be missed. She was a mainstay in that congregation. Uh, But she had been a Christian and a member of that church for over 60 years. Uh, So she definitely is in a much better place uh, today as we speak. I like new things. What I mean by that is I like technology. I am a fan of the microwave oven. (laughs) To think that you can take a bag about that small and put it in there and three minutes later you're enjoying hot popcorn is just absolutely wonderful to me. To know that I can take the leftovers when there are any and put them in there, and in about a minute, they're hot and ready for me to eat. I love central heat and air. We're spoiled with that. We feel when we come into the building, oh, it's too hot or it's too cold. You know why that is? Because we've become spoiled with this modern, say, well, it may not be so modern, but it's still relatively new. I know my grandmother never enjoyed central heating and air until she was late in her life and she thought it was just the greatest thing in the world Uh, she would make them set her over the vent (laughs) so she could feel whatever air was coming she just thought that was the greatest thing in the world she told me she said my air conditioning as a kid was we would take a block of ice and put a fan behind it and it would blow the cold air over the block of ice and she said that was my modern day air conditioning at the time and she said I just thought that was the greatest thing too I like phones. I like the the, the convenience that these new cell phones have. I've mentioned that before. But you know, not everything modern is good. There are a lot of things that are going on in the world today that is, quote, given the label of new and modern. And it's created created a stumbling block 
uh, in society as far as dealing with things religiously. Uh, I'm not one that wants to rewrite history. I've never been one that would want to try to do that. I would like to think that I'm an individual who has the ability to adapt uh, to how things change around me. Uh, And I hope that that we all basically have learned to do that. I don't want to go back to where you had to go to the outhouse. I don't necessarily want to go back that when you needed water that you sent one of your children out in uh, the snow or the rain or the heat or whatever it was to go do the old hand pump well anybody ever had to do that several of you where you go to the hand pump well and 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 pump water and bring it into the house it's kind of nice to be able to just walk over and turn that little knob isn't it turn the other knob and you've got hot water so i'm not necessarily saying that i'd like to go back you know that far in time and, and and come up with one of these great ideas but there are things i'd like to change You know, the idea of the family is considered to many an an extinct idea. The idea of husband and wife raising children together is almost an extinct idea. The idea of respecting the possessions and the property of other people has almost become an extinct idea. Today, the thing that rises the most, with the exception of the gas prices, is the crime rate. It's a day and time that we live in where kids are killed because they wear a certain brand of shoes, because somebody wanted those shoes, where people are robbed on highways, in parking lots, and even now in stores, a time where Violent crimes have increased at an alarming rate. That's not good. And that's the modern world in which we live. So that, yes, I'd like to go back. I often used to think that I'd like to be the guy that rode the white horse. You know, the white horse in the movies was the good guy. And then the guy comes in in the black horse, and you know instantly now we've got this rival. Uh, that there's going to be this great shootout at the OK Corral. I'm not saying we ought to have shootouts, but I'm saying that there needs to be a justice system that is in place that rightly handles things the way the Bible says they should be handled. You think about the breakdown of the home, that the divorce rate is up somewhere near now. This astonished me when I read this. That the divorce right now is up somewhere near, if not over, 80%. And we wonder where it comes from. How many of you watch television? It's okay, I watch it too. <laughs> Everybody's like, uh, what's he want? I watch it too. But a lot of the ideas that have crept in society have been fueled and fed by the things that we see on television where family values has now taken a a, a swift turn because a certain television show may promote that. And I'm not going to stand up here and tell you I'm talking about television shows. That's not my intent. It's not my idea to start pinpointing shows and say, well, if you watch this, you're in trouble. That's not it. But you can see, if you watch any television at all, that the very idea of what is being promoted in some of these shows is not a good idea. I remember when I was a kid, I would get up in the morning, and it wasn't I got up when I wanted to get up, it was mom got me up at about 8 o'clock every morning during the summer. That was the time that she would either get ready to leave to go somewhere, but at 8 o'clock every morning, I knew I was getting up. And there would be breakfast waiting, whether it was cereal, Pop-Tarts, or sometimes she would cook, and my mom cooked a lot. And after I finished my, my breakfast, mom would very gently walk me to the door and say, I don't want to see you until lunch. <laughs> and it wasn't because she didn't care for me, it was because she wanted me outside. 
She wanted me out doing things. She didn't want me. Of course, we didn't have all the video games and things like that that kids have today. And then at 12 o'clock, I would hear her call my name. And I'd come back, and I knew that I was going to have a lunch. And there I would eat lunch. And then after lunch, she would allow me, if I wanted to, to stick around for a little while. And then she would come and get me, and she'd say, Now get out. I don't want to see you till 6 o'clock. Now some of you are probably thinking, Man, what a cruel mother you had. Well, I think I had one of the best mothers in the world. Because she taught me the value of getting out and socializing with my friends uh, and, and not just hiding in a corner of the house uh, playing games or doing whatever, but being involved in what was going on in the world. I could have friends over to our house anytime that I wanted to, but guess where we had to be? Outside. I used to think that's because she was afraid we would tear something up. And more than likely, more times than not, we would have. But the idea of the things that we are seeing in the world today, the things of, of kids being abused at an alarming rate, just absolutely terrifies me. So I'd like to kind of go back to times where family values were a little different. Roger read for us there in Jeremiah chapter 6, and I want you to turn there if you haven't already, if you're still there. Going back and talking religiously for a moment, we see the idea of the breakdown of the home. We see the idea of the rising crime rate and everything like that. But what about religiously? Anybody interested in going back in time religiously? I like our modern technology. I like PowerPoint. I like the idea to be able to see the songs up here. I like the idea that you can flip out your tablet or your phone and there you can bring up any version of scripture that, that you want to bring up and there you can follow along and make notes with what we're doing. I like all of that. I'm not talking about things like that. I'm talking about that the idea that modern Christianity today, that some people have tried to change it so much that it doesn't even resemble what Christianity was 40 years ago, and that we have messed with it so much, the idea, well, we need to bring it more into modern day uh, the world. Well, how much more can we do? Uh, the latest I saw was now, and I've, I've mentioned this before, that there was a congregation that I recently saw, maybe several months ago, that is now offering drive through communion. That we have reduced the amount of time that we give God in our worship service, that now you can drive up to a window, seriously, like going to the bank, and there they will hand you the, the emblems of the Lord's Supper, and you can take that, and you can be on your way. That we have micromanaged what we believe religion should be, and that's all that is required. Folks, I understand the importance of the Lord's Supper, but it is not the single thing that is most important in what we do in worship. Its focus may be on the greatest element of why we're here, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, but everything we do in worship is commanded by God, isn't it? to sing and to pray and to give and to, and to study from God's Word. Those are all things that are talked about in Scripture that we're commanded to do. But modern-day religion has bought it, got us to, a lot of people to thinking, oh, you don't need to do all of that, just take communion. Next thing it's going to be is, well, just get on the email and we'll send you something through email and that's all your responsibility you'll have. It's amazing to me that in all of those scenarios to where uh, the idea of coming together as a congregation, as a family, of all the shortcuts they try to come up with, there's one thing they always seem to never miss. Anybody have any idea what it is? Contribution. They still want your money. We don't want your time. We don't need you to be around as long as you send your check. Something doesn't fit, does it? So everything modern isn't good. I like old-fashioned lemonade. 
I like old-fashioned potato salad. Well, I, I like potato salad. Let me, I don't want to lie there. I, I'll take the modern version as well. That'll be okay. I like old movies. I like old preachers. No, J.D., that's not you. I'm not talking about I like to be around old, wise men who've dedicated their life in serving the Lord because I learn from them. I have learned so much from J.D. in the three years that I, almost three years that I have been here. And, you know, he hasn't said a whole lot to me. Always offering support. Always being encouraging. But what a humble, graceful, kind servant he is. And that's what I want to be. And you learn those things by being around people like that. People like Gary Cook, who we laugh with. Gary's not afraid to speak his mind. But he's so ready at a moment's notice to anybody that will listen, he will proclaim the gospel to people like that people like our elders Mark and Mac and Bob and Andy men who have given so much of their time because they love the Lord with all of their heart and they love this church with all of their heart do you always agree with what they do no But do we really realize the painstaking commitment of what it is to be an elder? I've always aspired that one day I wanted to be an elder, but I, as long as I preach, I will never be an elder because I think it's a contradiction. I think it's two separate roles that the Bible defines. So for me to ever be an elder someday, I'll have to quit preaching. And I don't really necessarily want to do that. Maybe you'd like me to do that. I don't know. I think about men like Bruce Adams who I have known for several years for his courage and his boldness about proclaiming the truth. If you've never had the opportunity to talk to Bruce, I, I, I'd like you to do that. And I want Bruce to tell you his story because it will bring you to tears. You see, Bruce wasn't raised like a lot of us. Bruce was raised in foster homes, in an orphanage, in a children's home. In places that loved him and places that didn't. He told me a story one time that even when I talk about it now, it breaks my heart. That he was with a, a family and he was... They were to take care of him. He was a foster child, but at Christmas time, he says, I remember sitting over in the corner and I had to watch them open their Christmas presents. And I didn't have any. But Bruce will tell you that Fort Hill Christian Youth Camp saved his life. And you would never know it by spending time with Bruce. He's so upbeat. Has the corniest jokes you'll ever hear. but he loves the Lord. And folks, I could go on through this auditorium and name one right after the other. You know, guys like Larry, who are so talented, that I wish that I had just a pinky's worth of the knowledge of how to do things like Larry does. I don't think there's anything he can't do. Well, I haven't found it yet, brother. People like Pam, who many of you see here at church, but I get the privilege and the pleasure 
to work with her on a daily basis and to see the love and the commitment that she has for this congregation. And again, I could go on and on, but I don't want to do that. I don't want to leave. I love you all. But to be around people that have a genuine, sincere love for the Lord and all that they want to do is go to heaven. And that's what Centerville's all about. We want to go to heaven, and we want to take as many people as we possibly can with us. Now, that's my introduction. You ready for the sermon? <laughs> Yesterday, I did the, the funeral of this lady, and I tell you, she was my biggest fan and my biggest critic at the same time. She knew the Bible. She knew it well. And any time that I would misquote a scripture, she would come to me in the foyer as we were shaking hands, and she'd say, you missed that one. And I'd say, what did I miss? And, man, she'd spout it off. And some Sundays I'd get them all right, and she'd just walk by and go, I knew I was good for another week. But it's good to be around people like that. You know, I look over here, and I see Fran sitting very peacefully with her arms folded Fran is very quiet and humble and I'm going to throw this word in there in my mind a righteous woman and I appreciate her comments in class and the things that she does that many of you have no clue that she does and I get to go around and tell people that I know you people and that I'm part of this family, and that we, we have a love relationship where we don't have to be perfect. We're just together. I like old time religion. And what I mean by that is old time religion that is based upon the Bible. Not based on what any man thought or thinks, but it's strictly based on Scripture. I like the old-time faith that's talked about in the Bible. That you can go to you know, the book of Hebrews in chapter 11, and there you're going to get the heroes of faith. And if you remember several weeks ago, I put an article in the bulletin that talked about God's Hall of Fame. And if you remember reading that or not, you probably don't. It's hard to remember something you read three weeks ago. It's hard to remember the sermon that I even preached last week. I can't even remember what I preached last week at this moment. But you look at that list of great heroes of faith. There's Abel, there's Abraham, and there's Isaac. And it talks about how the things that they did in their life, that God considered them so high that he had the writer of the book of Hebrews list those people. Because they're great people of faith. And if God were keeping a book today of people of great faith, where would you fit? Would your name be on that list? To go down and say, here is an individual that I want generations to come to know of their faithfulness. Of their commitment to God's word of their commitment to doing right, of their commitment to always being good. This lady that passed away yesterday, she raised seven kids. And one of the sons got up to speak and he said, I can tell you this. These are the things that my mom did, but there's something that my mom never did. And he said, I never ever heard my mother utter a harsh word or complain about anything. I was ready to repent right then. Because it seems like I complain about a lot of things. I think we all complain about things. But he said in her 94 years or 92 years, she never complained about anything. Can you imagine? Go the rest of the day, today, until you go to bed tonight, and don't complain about one thing. Don't complain about the sermon. Don't complain about the weather. <laughs> Don't complain about waiting too long to have to eat lunch. Don't complain today. 
Find the good in everything that you come across because that's what a faithful Christian does. That's those people that we see listed in the great chapter of, of faith that these people did what God and lived what God wanted them to do and God said, look, put them in the Bible. List them as great men of faith. I want to be one of those people. I want to be like some of you and probably a little bit of all of you to your good characteristics that I can adapt them to my life and even adopt them into my life to where I can be a better person. I like old-fashioned faithfulness that the Bible talks about. I'm talking about faithfulness of being obedience, that we accept what the Bible has to say about what God would have us to do. You know, you, there's two examples that I want to give this morning. Go to Acts chapter 8. I know you're marked in Jeremiah. I'll get back to that. Maybe. In Acts chapter 8, here is an example of what I call old religious faithfulness. In Acts chapter 8, you have the story of the Ethiopian eunuch. You remember the story. He was riding along in the chariot, studying the Bible, and God sent Philip to him. And Philip began to where he was at in his faith. He didn't immediately go to him and said, I'm going, to, I'm going to teach you about things I think you should know. But he began where he was at, what his level of understanding was at. And that's important, folks. We need to get people where they're at in their level of understanding and bring them forward from there. And he preached unto him from Isaiah the prophet all the way forward to Jesus Christ dying on the cross raising from the dead, ascending into heaven so that we now have forgiveness of sins. And it clearly says in verse 36, the question was asked Philip, here is water, what doth hindereth me to be baptized? You can go on in the book of Acts and go to Acts chapter 16, maybe one of the most controversial uh, verses in the Bible, and there you have the story of the Philippian jailer. But they were astonished at the faithfulness of these men. That in Acts chapter 16, we see there, it says that in the middle of the chapter, it talks about, you know, why didn't you do this and why didn't you do that? And, and because we're Christians and we're going to be the best Christians that we can be. You know, slavery is one of those topics. You know, everybody says, well, you know, slavery was condemned in the Bible. You know, slavery was never condemned in the Bible. But what the Bible did, what the writers did, and what God did, God said, if you're a master of a slave, you be righteous. You treat them fair. And if you're a slave, what do you do? You give honor and respect and do. If you're a husband in the Bible, what does it say? Do you lord it over your wife? No. You give honor. You give respect. In the same way with the wife. It fits. In Acts chapter 16, there we find in verse 31, they're talking about salvation. What do we do? And there they tell them, if you'll just believe with all of your heart that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, you'll be saved. <clears throat> if you stop right there, which the world does, saying that's all you need to do, that makes salvation seem very, 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 very simple. More simple than maybe what we, what we teach that it is. But they didn't know what they were talking about. Who is this Jesus? Why do we need to believe on this Jesus? And if you read the next verse, it says there, Then they spoke the word of the Lord to them and to all his house, and he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes, and immediately he and all of his household were baptized 31 they didn't know what to believe in the verses following they were taught and that's the old time religion the last thing that I want to think about is the church <coughs> I like an old time church 
you're an old time church you know what I mean by that we, we're in an old building no that's not what I mean we're what I call an old time church because I think you love each other unconditionally I hope you do I pray you do and if you don't please change you still care about reaching lost souls and that's the most important thing do we want to grow yes but we want the right kind of growth we want families coming in we want people that have never heard about jesus christ and they are in this vicinity and we want to teach them about the love of jesus christ and the love of god and you would rather save souls than anything else that's an old time church to me Secondly, I believe that each and every one of you have a sincere desire to be like Christ. When a Christian, when you wear the name Christian, you are saying to God that I'm going to be like Christ. And I see it from people every day in this congregation. Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 16. Stand in the ways and see. And ask for the old paths, where is, where is the good way, and walk therein, and you will find rest for your souls. We're a good family. There's good folks here. And I believe it's all right sometimes to break from a traditional sermon and just remind us of how lucky we are. And I could go on. I could pick on Mark right now, but since he's had hip surgery, I won't do that. <laughs> but I love Mark's knowledge of the Bible. I love his commitment to study the Bible. And I love the fact that Margaret puts up with him. <laughs> Folks, we're a good congregation. Let's continue to make it our focus as we embark on the last part, and I'm not trying to rush time, but as we embark on the last part of the year of 2015, let's make a conscientious effort with people that we come in contact with to bring them to Christ. You see, we live in a world today, I want to tell you a, a sad story, then this lesson is yours. Hope showed me this yesterday. We studied the book Muscle and a Shovel here. We had a class that used the book. If you haven't read that book, let me encourage you to do that. It's written by a member of the church. He has canceled his speaking dates for the rest of the year because he has now received a very reliable source death threat simply because of his message. And his response to, the, to that was, folks, I'm not afraid of that, but for the idea to me to put other people in harm's way because somebody's hatred for me and for the message, I'm not going to do that. But that's the world in which we live. But where there's fear involved. But you're a congregation that I believe wholeheartedly will never, ever let anything deter you from reaching lost souls and going to heaven. And that's what's important. I love each and every one of you. You all bring something different. You all have your outstanding qualities. But the greatest is your love for God. Folks, let's keep on. Let's keep working. Let's keep singing. Let's keep smiling. Let's keep praying. And let's keep teaching. And won't it be grand to someday see each other in heaven? Yes.
it will be great. Different sermon. The invitation is still being offered. If you're not a Christian this morning, oh, what you're missing. We're going to sing the invitation song to encourage you that if you've never obeyed the gospel, that you'll do that. That you'll make the confession that you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And that you're willing to repent of the sins that were in your life and be buried with Him in baptism. Then you become a faithful child of God. We're going to sing that song to encourage you or as a Christian, maybe you need the prayers of this church. Folks, we're not here to judge you. We're here to love you. And that's all we want to do. If we can help you this morning, won't you come as we stand and sing?